amazing love, how can it be? And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's ways? Died he for me who caused his pains? For me who Father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace, emptied himself of all but love, and bled for Adam's helpless
Good morning and welcome to worship at Westminster Presbyterian Church, Omaha. This is the Reverend Portia Iverson. The call to worship. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar and all its fullness. Let the field be joyful and all that is in it. For he is coming, he is coming to judge the earth and the peoples with his truth. Let us worship God. Our scripture this morning is from Matthew's Gospel, the 13th chapter the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the yeast. Listen for the word of God. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nest in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. Jesus told the crowds all these things in parables. Without a parable, he told them nothing. This was to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet I will open my mouth to speak in parables. I will proclaim what has been hidden from the foundation of the world. The gospel of our Lord, thanks be to God. Let us pray. O Holy Spirit of grace, lead us to hear your holy word with faith and attention that it may lead us in your way and that we may return to your church the blessings we receive from her. Amen. Today's reading reveals how God works in ways which are at once mysterious and unexpected. The truth of the matter is we can't box God in. We can't limit God to our own expectations. And the gospel reading today offers a parable about growth in God's kingdom. First, we remind ourselves, what is a parable? Well, as the Presbyterian minister Frederick Buechner puts it, a parable is a small story with a large point. And this morning we have two very small parables before us. But small is large. Each parable is filled with meaning, riches, and is like a nugget of gold. In the first, Jesus explains the kingdom of God is as if someone should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed sprouts and grows. You may remember the old children's nursery rhyme that would go, Mary, Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? With silver bells and cockle shells and pretty maids all in a row. Well, that's not how things grew in Palestine. There, every farmer knew how difficult it was to raise a good crop, let alone have seeds growing by themselves. For starters, there was an annual five-month drought, not to mention swarms of insects, uncleared topsoil containing more rocks than a quarry. An old Arabic tale illustrates the point. It went like this. When Allah was creating the world, he entrusted all the stones to two angels, giving each a bagful. As the angels were flying over Palestine, one of the bags broke open, and half the stones intended for the whole world spilled onto that small area. Well, it certainly 
wasn't like farming here in the Midwest or back in New Jersey in what was called the Garden State, where my first church was. Here, the sower in the parable does not understand the growth, and yet it's clear harvest comes. Jesus is revealing to us this day in this parable a very important secret of the kingdom, that kingdom growth is not in our power. It is beyond our conscious control. There's nothing we can do to make it happen. It does not respond to our willfulness like a New Year's resolution. We do not control the results. God does. And what matters is our availability to be grown by the Spirit. That's all we have to do, to be open to growth. What matters is being present to God and being wholeheartedly open to receiving the kingdom. For the kingdom of God is like the seed, which by the power of God produces a harvest. And the seed itself is a marvelous image for the mysterious working of the kingdom, something that goes beyond any human measure or expectation. And in the mustard seed parable this morning, we are reminded how great things can come from small and seemingly unpromising beginnings. Now, small is large is a paradox for us. It's difficult for us to wrap our minds around that because it is so different from the culture in which we live. We all know that we're in love with bigness, from mega churches to the Big Mac that we eat while we watch the Super Bowl, to shopping super centers, or to the McHouses with three-car garages that we build. And yet, Jesus tells us the kingdom of God is just the opposite, like a grain of mustard seed. And you may remember how small the mustard seed was. Back when I was in high school, there was uh, often a little necklace that was worn uh, by young women, maybe in confirmation class, getting ready to join the church. And there was in it, in a clear plastic bubble, one small, single mustard seed to remind us of our faith and mustard seed faith. Well, the mustard plant itself is an annual. It grew wild in Palestine, and it would grow normally to a four-foot shrub. But once it got established, it was impossible to get it out. And the mustard plant itself had a very pungent taste and was used for seasoning and medicinal purposes. Well, the careful listener from Jesus' time would have picked up on a line of this parable, the mustard seed sown in the ground or garden. You see, for the Hebrew people, there was a prohibition about growing two kinds of seeds together. If you had a garden, you wouldn't be putting a mustard seed there too because the farmer would be violating what is known as the law of diverse kinds. What's going on here? Well, we're reminded again that the purpose of a parable is to turn the mind of the reader around. And parables are there to purposely cause us some confusion and reversal of thinking. Jesus, or Ezekiel, was to tell us, I bring low the high tree, I make high the low. In God's kingdom, prideful nations and people will be brought down, and the lowly and the humble will be raised up. What Jesus is reminding us this morning is a wonderful thing, and that is that great things can come from small and unlikely beginnings. The mustard shrub grows so large that we read that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. The kingdom is not only large, but it's life-giving and protective. 
And we're, we're reminded that God's mighty works are found in unexpected places among what we would dismiss as insignificant. Nothing perhaps illustrates this better for our time about how small becomes large than the story of a woman called Osceola McCarty of Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And she first came to public attention, national attention, in an article in the New York Times in August of 1995. And let me share her story with you this day. Osceola McCarty spent a lifetime making other people look nice. Day after day, for most of her 87 years, she took in bundles of dirty clothes and made them clean and neat for parties she never attended, weddings to which she was never invited, graduations she never saw. She had to quit school in the sixth grade to go to work, never married, never had children, and never learned to drive because, as she put it, there was never one place in particular she wanted to go. All she ever had was her work, which she saw as a blessing. Too many other people in Mississippi did not even have that. She spent almost nothing living in her old family home, cutting the toes out of shoes if they did not fit right, and binding her ragged Bible in scotch tape to keep Corinthians from falling out. Over the decade, her pay, mostly dollar bills and change, grew to more than $150,000 saved. More than I could ever use, Ms. McCarty explained, without a trace of self-pity. So as the New York Times article went over, went over, she is giving her money away to finance scholarships for black students at the University of Southern Mississippi, located in her hometown, where tuition is $2,400 a year. I wanted to share my wealth with the children, said Ms. McCarty, whose only real regret is that she never went back to school. I never minded work, but I was always so busy, busy. Maybe I can make it so the children don't have to work like I did. People in Hattiesburg call her donation the gift. She made it in part in anticipation of her death. As she sat in her warm, dark living room with a reporter, she talked of that death matter-of-factly, the same way she talked about the possibility of an afternoon thunderstorm. To her, the gift was a preparation, like closing the bedroom window to keep the rain from blowing in on the bedspread. Her devotion piqued interest around the nation. In a few short days, Osceola McCartney, the washerwoman, had risen from obscurity to a notice that even she did not understand. She sits in her frame house just blocks from the university, which she picked because it's here, it's close, and patiently greets the reporters, business leaders, and others who line up outside her door. I've been in business 24 years now, said the executive director of the University of Southern Mississippi Foundation, and this is the first time I've ever experienced anything like this from an individual who simply was not affluent, did not have the resources, yet gave substantially. In fact, she gave almost everything she has. No one from the, approached her from the university, she approached us. She's seen the poverty, the young people who struggled, who need an education. He concluded, she is the most unselfish individual I have ever met. Osceola McCarty's life was like a living illustration of mustard seed faith, where a seed grows to amazing fulfillment, where small becomes great, when sown by mustard seed people. Today's word through scripture and story calls up in us a sense of reassurance and recommitment. We're assured that the kingdom's power is ours for the asking, 
And what we have been given and what grows mysteriously within us must be given away. And mustard seed people have a way of spreading the gospel beyond anyone's wildest dreams. So may our understanding of the mysteries of the gospel through the Holy Spirit and the community of faith grow this day. May our hearts be enlightened. May we as mustard seed people scatter the seeds of the kingdom to grow beyond our wildest expectations. Amen and amen. Let us join together in prayer. Let us pray. Eternal Spirit, from whom we come, to whom we belong, and in whose service is our peace, grant us today an open-hearted hospitality to your presence. From the hurry and turmoil of the world, we come to your sanctuary to be quieted, cleansed, guided, and empowered. Forgive our sins, comfort our sorrows, allay our fears, challenge our consciences. Restore and renew us with your grace as we open to you ourselves and our very souls. O oh God, we cannot live without your blessing. We come to you in our weakness, asking for your strength. Let us not be disheartened with the difficulties we bear. Let us never doubt your love or any of your promises. We bring before you now the cares and concerns of our hearts and minds. We pray for peace in your world and among peoples. We pray for your healing, helping touch upon all those who suffer from the coronavirus and in other ways, especially Father Ponick, whose congregation worship, worships here. We pray for all who serve their country at home and abroad, for those who are about to return to school, for children everywhere, for those who find themselves out of work, with all resources running out, we pray that they will find their peace in you. We pray for your glorious solutions for all the problems we face at this time as a nation, knowing that if we have you, we have everything, and that your way will bring us prosperity, comfort, and joy. Lord, help us to be a blessing to all we meet, always making life easier, never harder. And dear Lord, as we are fed with your presence, help us to be Christ-like to those we meet so that through us they may see something and feel something of his abundant love. We ask now for you to hear us and to receive our prayers to be with this church and all of your church universal in the days ahead. Those known to us in other places to whom we make known to you their names. Those who are in difficulty for their faith. Those who feel lost and adrift. And now in confidence, we lift our voices in the words we were taught to pray together by our Lord, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit 
be with us and all who love the Lord and all his people everywhere, now and forevermore. Amen and amen.